I have become aware that my preaching can, can be a little abrasive. Uh, that's because uh, I, I tend to um, say uh, radical things, like uh, uh, <laughs> the most radical thing I've been saying lately is that God does not uh, kill children. Yeah. Uh, I think most people would agree with that um, unless they remember all of those times in the Old Testament where it tells us, it tells us that God uh, killed uh, children, okay? Now, it doesn't seem like something that the God we know through Jesus Christ would do, but we find those stories right in the in the in the Bible, I'll tell you what you don't want to be if you're in the Old Testament. You do not want to be an Egyptian. How, ma how many of the plagues that God sent on the Egyptians can you remember? <clears throat> Holler out one. What? Frogs. Frogs. <laughs> yes. How can you forget the frogs? What else? Flies. Flies. Now, why was God, as the scripture tells us, doing this to the Egyptians? Because they would not let the Hebrew uh, children, the Hebrew people, uh, go from uh, slavery, uh, flies, uh, dead cattle. Uh, here's the worst of all of them. Locusts. Locusts. What is a locust? What do we call it? It's a grasshopper. Uh, we used to... Uh, when I, when I was a kid, uh, God uh, mistakenly believed that uh, my family was Egyptian. Yes, yes. Uh, he had not figured out that we were not Egyptian. And so he sent in the summer hordes of locusts onto our farm that devoured, well, they devoured the fields, of course, but they also devoured all of my mother's orange daylilies that spread all the way across the front of the house and they would leave only a stem sticking up with nothing else visible. Sometimes they didn't seem to like the flowers. I mean, they were not pollinating. They were just eating. And so you would have this stick sticking up with a beautiful orange flower on the end of it and all of the leaves gone. And when you walked across the, the front yard, you could see these grasshoppers just scattering like that. Oh, my Lord, I'm glad I, I grew out of being an Egyptian because I couldn't face that for the rest of my life. Well, and uh, there were boils. I hate boils. And uh, there was darkness. And the last thing was the killing of the, of the children. Yes. Um, well, here's, here's, here's how it goes down in the Scriptures. Then Moses called all of the elders, elders of Israel and said to them, Go select lambs for, for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb and take a branch of hyssop and dip it in blood of the lamb in a basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood in the basin. None of you shall go outside the door of your house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to come to your house to strike you down. You shall observe this rite as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. If my family had only known that blood trick when I was growing up, I'm not making light of the scripture. It's not a light story. 
it's quite a sad one, depending on whether you're Hebrew or Egyptian. The Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all of his officials and all of the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry throughout Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Well, I would usually follow that by saying this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, but I'm going to hold off on that just a little bit uh, because um, this strikes me as, as being as being somehow not quite right. And here's the problem, and it is a problem. We're headed for an election. No, I'm not going to get deep into politics today. Some of us are very nervous. Because in 16 days, there is a real possibility that we will see the end of democracy as we know it. And it, it may not just last for four years. It may be a loss. And the change in the world will be so significant just on the basis of this vote that the world may have trouble getting back to where we are now. And yes, I'm worried, Lord God. You know, I am praying right now. I'm asking for your help. And here's the interesting thing about that. The country is nearly 50-50 Divided. Extraordinary. And a lot of those folks on the other half of that 50 are sitting in churches today. And something is drastically wrong with the way we have understood the teachings of Jesus or the way we have ignored the teachings of Jesus. I don't believe for a moment that God killed those firstborn children. I don't believe it for a moment, but millions and millions and millions of Christians do. And if there are other preachers who don't believe that, they're, they're generally afraid to say so. But you get to a certain age, you don't worry so much about what you say. Hey, he was fired when he was 81. Oh, well, <laughs> there you are. He had a pretty good run before that. I think I've tended always to just tell the truth, and the truth of the matter is God doesn't kill children. He doesn't kill anybody's firstborn. The truth of the matter is that God loves Egyptians just as much as he loves everybody else, and he did at that time too. And God was not in the habit of leaving mothers weeping because they had had their child killed by the death angel at night. This is not the work of God. It needs to be said loud and clear because if you believe it is, then you have tremendous trouble actually believing what Jesus said. You have a lot of trouble believing that. And it is because the church in general does not really believe what Jesus says that we are in this mess. This mess is a moral mess. There actually is no real choice to be made in this upcoming you know what. 
But here we are divided because the message of Jesus just has not been claimed by the church in general. And Jesus can say, love your enemies. God loves all of us. Love those that don't love you. He can say it all the way to the cross. And still, the church cannot turn loose of extraordinary, primitive material extraordinarily primitive material just because it's in the Bible. Jesus knew this would be true. <laughs> he told us what to do. And we have done the opposite. I'm talking about the church in general. Jesus said, listen, if you have an old garment, an old garment, it's a visibly old garment because it has holes in it. Now, the King James translation, I think, said coat, so I've always thought of it as a coat. We'll take a coat. Now, if you've got an old coat, your old winter coat, and it's got holes in it, he said, let me tell you what not to do. You do not take a new coat and cut out patches from the new coat and put those patches in the holes in the old coat just to patch it up. Because what have you got then? He said the new cloth is going to shrink, and when it does, it's going to <laughs> create holes again in the old coat Secondly, old coat going to look kind of funny with all those patches on it. And the new coat, the new coat now has holes in it. He said, you do not take new wine and put it in the old vessel because that new wine is going to be so active, it's going to split the wine skins, and you're going to lose both your old wine skins and you're going to lose the wine. He said, you must put the new wine in the new wine skin. said, he was telling us that what he was presenting to us was new. It wasn't like the old. He used to tell people, you know, in olden times, olden times, you know, in former times, you know, men in the past used to say to you, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, you do not retaliate against the neighbor, but who is he? Who does he think he is? That line was right out of Scripture. Who does this guy think he is saying, old? Who is that old guy? It's Moses. Who does he think he is? Contradicting something that Moses said to us. What can we do with this guy? Surely we need to kill him. That's what they did. Who does he think he is? Well, who do we think he is? What rock do we stand on? I think every preacher in America ought to be telling people that this great old story, and it's a great old story, it's wonderful. It's written beautifully. It's from a former time. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It presents an image of God entirely different from what our Lord taught us. But we need to cherish this old story. Listen, I have got two, two, not just one. I have got two shirts that I wore when I was in high school. I do not wear those shirts anymore. Now, there are two reasons. You can guess one reason. 
I would look funny going out in public with a shirt that was only pulled over this arm because it wouldn't go any further. All right? That's one reason. Second reason is they're in lousy shape. Why do I still hang on to them? Well, they're kind of precious to me, and they bring back memories of my high school days when I was a football star <laughs> sitting on the bench every game. I had the best seat in the house for all the games. <laughs> <laughs> right there on the bench watching. Brings back memories. I'd, I've never been able to throw those shirts away, nor do I feel that I have to. I can hang on to them. And the truth of the matter is, dear friends, some of the greatest stories in the world are in the Old Testament. Oh, and also there is great wisdom and there is great enlightenment and there is great joy and there is great pain and everything in the Old Testament. It is a blessing for us to have it. But the theology of the Old Testament never, ever rises to the level of the teachings of Jesus. Billy Graham, when he was a young man, was deeply troubled. Billy was a smart guy, very smart guy, charismatic. I enjoyed watching him. I went to a crusade one time just to see Billy because he was an icon. I still love him and admire him. We won't talk about his son. I still love Billy and I admire him. When he was a young man, he was troubled because he saw inconsistencies in the Bible. And they bothered him. They're there. Inconsistencies between the, the God presented in this and the God that Jesus talked about. Factual inconsistencies where... <laughs> where Mark, for some exact reason, tells us that when the women found the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday, they were all scared to death and they ran off and didn't tell anybody. And then John and the other Gospels tells us they went immediately and told the other disciples. And Peter and the beloved disciple ran to the tomb along with Mary Madeline and looked in and saw what was there. Now, they can't both be true. It's John that's true, and Mark's all messed up. Why Mark chose that route, I don't know. If he knew better, he should have done better. But <laughs> there's no way to reconcile those two things. And Billy was a smart boy, and he knew that. When he was 21 years old, he went out into the woods, and he took the Bible, and he just laid it open on a stump in front of him. And he was weeping and crying. And he knelt before that Bible and said, I am going to accept you as I accept the Lord Jesus Christ just on faith. And that's where Billy gave up his thinking mind and gave up a little bit of morality in his preaching as he knelt before the Bible to essentially worship this rather than worshiping first, foremost, and always the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament should be a blessing to us if we know how to read it. But the church has made it a millstone around its neck that pulls the church down and away from Jesus. You can no longer believe in vengeance after what Jesus said. 
No one who knew what Jesus said would ever be attracted by anyone who proclaims vengeance. No one who says, when someone hits me once, I hit them ten times over. That should never be attractive to a Christian. And now we are in this mess where everything is at stake. Everything that our soldiers have suffered and died for on battlefields for nearly 250 years, all of it is at stake because the church has not successfully let go of the old coat and cherish the new one. Cherish the old one, fold it, put it in a drawer, Hang your two old high school shirts in your closet along with the stuff you wear today. But you cannot get your theology from anything other than Jesus Christ and, and his teachings if you're going to be right. If you're going to be right. And then those who follow him, Paul and, and the New Testament apostles. And so here we are. So if it happens, just remember that it is partly the failure of the church of Jesus Christ that has allowed this to happen. It is the tenacity of Christians to hang on to the old and not go with the new. To stick with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and forget that Jesus said, don't do that anymore. Don't do what they said before. Do what I tell you to do. How do we know what's right? That answer is so simple. If it ain't love, it ain't God. One of my favorite lines from any religious experience I have ever read comes from a fellow named R. N. Buck, who had an extraordinary experience of God back in the 19th century. And he said that one thing he brought out of that experience is this, and I, I say it to you because it is, a, it is a declaration of the teachings of our Lord. He said, and you've heard me say this before, love is the foundation principle of the world. It is why Jesus came into the world for love of us. It is why he stretched himself upon that cross and allowed them to put nails in his hands and his feet for love. It is he who said from the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It is all about love and it really ain't about nothing else. If it's not love, if it's not loving, it's not God. I, I, I encourage you to read this book and read the whole book, the whole one. You could even drag yourself through revelations if you want to. Go ahead. Take that slog. But here's the rule of thumb. If the God you meet, even in this book, is not loving. It's not God. If the God you meet in the book is not the God of both the Hebrews and the Egyptians, it's not God. If you God the, the God you meet in the book is not only the God of America, but the God of France and England and Czechoslovakia and Mexico, then it's not God. It is love. All that God does for us, has ever done for us, or will ever done, do for us, is done in love. Here is the truest statement that anybody will ever make about God. It's three little words from the blessed John. God is love.
Join me in prayer. Gracious God, we appeal to you now. Help us through this trying time. Let the witness of this church make a difference. Help us to tell as many in the world around us as we can that you love us and you love all. Help us, Lord God, to spread this word. In Jesus' name, amen.